Good evening. This is the Galeford Connecticut Board of Education. It is Tuesday, October 11th. Um, I invite you to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's, um, it's an a exciting board meeting tonight. We have our, our student representatives um, for the year joining us for the first time, so we look forward to introducing them uh, in a few minutes. Um, we are going to start off with action on the minutes, so um, I'm going to ask for a motion to accept uh, the September 12, 2022 regular meeting minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, any comments or corrections on those minutes? Um, I'm, I'm going to make um, uh, one uh, correction or, or request. So under um, six communications, where it notes that I um, read the statement um, from the board um, in response to the pending litigation, I, I'm going to provide the full statement mm -hmm. For inclusion in the minutes, which I think is better than trying to kind of summarize or parse, and, um, and should have thought of that before, Terry. So thank thank you so much. Um, but what I'll do is is provide that. So I'm going to ask that that be an uh, an amendment to the meetings that um, instead of yeah, Terry, um, that complete language is right on the website. So we'll strike six totally. I, I th we're gonna we're gonna strike six. I'm suggesting we strike six. And um, and replace it with, with the, the full statement. Are there other um, corrections or comments? None. Okay. Um, so um, hi, hi, Chris. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the September 12, 2022 meeting minutes as amended. Aye. 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 Are you okay? No, sorry, you had no, a I was saying aye. No, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Is that everybody? Aye, yeah. sorry. Okay, any opposed? Okay. Excellent. Uh, and now the September 27th, uh, 2022 workshop meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, <coughs> any comments or corrections to these minutes? None. All right. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. Aye. Excellent. Okay, that's everybody. Thank you. All right, we are up to number four, public forum for topics on the board agenda. Um, is there anyone in the public who would like to address the board on topics on the agenda? All right, uh, seeing and hearing none, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Hurst. Uh, for the review and approval of expenditures for the month of September. <clears throat> the expenditures were uh, $6,963,160.61. Um, pretty much the same percentage of the budget compared to last uh, year. Uh, revenue was fifty million. I'm sorry, $50,650.75. Um, A few highlights from the budget. Um, employee benefits shows that we're paying a lower premium this year, and it turns out that we had searched for a new um, workman's compensation um, insurance broker, and that came in at about $150,000 less than we were paying before. So it's considerable a lower premium. Um, we show that the percentage of the budget that's expended is higher than the prior year. That's mostly a function of timing of payments. Um, no, no surprises. Um, and we have one over expenditure on our part of our capital budget. Uh, over expenditure due to unanticipated projects and increased costs. That's specifically uh, an asbestos removal at Baldwin School. That, um, that's the oversheet. The a couple of things on the. The sheets that followed it. Um, 
we show um, a big increase in water this year compared to last year, and that turns out to be the, simply a timing of the irrigation bill. Um, we also show that we went up uh, significantly percentage-wise um, for security, and that is a function of the fact that we replaced the security cameras at Cox. Um, and finally, the last, what looks like an anomaly, we have a, a doubling of textbook costs this year, and that's in part because we bought new high school language arts texts. So those are the highlights of the things that look a little different. Right. There may be some further questions. Um, excellent. So this is um, something, uh, finances and warrants, that we discussed in uh, depth at the operations committee meeting just prior to this meeting, but uh, certainly open um, to any of my colleagues who might have comments or questions. All right, hearing none, um, can I please have a motion to accept um, and approve the uh, expenditures for September 2022? So moved. So moved. I have a motion, a second, second from this direction. All right, thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that's everybody. Thank you. All right, uh, up to communications. Um, does anybody have any communications? <coughs> I share. Do. You do. Okay. Um, I have um, a request from a friend who has a really, really cute brown and white guinea pig, <laughs> and they want to know if any of our elementary schools <coughs> would like a pet. So. If any of our elementary school principals would like to adopt a guinea pig, let me know. That is a fun communication. <laughs> we do this every month. <laughs> it's three years old. I can find a picture. This is going to start. Yeah. Wait till the llama to come out. All righty. Dr. Ball, Tracy, if I may, I'd just like to share that the um, I was really pleased to have an invitation from the American Legion last week and had the opportunity to speak Great. with Guilford's American Legion post. We talked about student performance in the Guilford schools. Uh, we talked about security. We talked about plans for the schools moving forward. I very much appreciated the invitation and it was a real pleasure. Oh, and we spoke about the new portrait of the graduate as well. It was a real yes, pleasure sure. to be able to speak with the American Legion. Oh, wonderful. They weren't giving out free pets that were there. They, there were no <laughs> guinea pig offers made. Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> All right, well that may be the most fun agenda item we've had in <laughs> All righty. Although now um, I get to ask um, Ms. Chap to um, come join us um, and introduce, if you would, um, our student representatives, one of one returning, who we know well, uh, and two new. My pleasure. Thank um, you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Julia Chaff, principal at Guilford High School. I am pleased to have uh, present Ruby Espejo, who is returning from last year as a student board of education representative. Um, she is a coach in unified sports, member of the Spanish Honor Society, and co-president of that society. She is a member of the Leadership Congress and the Cultural Competence Committee and is currently working with me and Principal Guerin on a No Place for Hate campaign for both GHS and Adams Middle School. She is the manager of a uh, Instagram spirit page called Guilford Cave and one of the photographers for that as well. And she, as you all know, is very passionate about helping others and has an interest in pursuing a career in politics and exploring careers within politics. So welcome back, Ruby. Wonderful to have you back. Thank you. Next, I would like to present Clara Gom, who is one of our juniors. She is an IB diploma student for the class of 2024. She's a member of the varsity cross country indoor track and outdoor track teams. She plays the clarinet for the wind ensemble, and she is a mentor not only for other musicians, but also within the student mentoring program, at which we will be kicking back into gear this year. Um, member of the Spanish Honor Society and also a member of the Leadership Congress at Gilbert High School. So welcome, Clara. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks, Clara. And last but not least, we have George Wiley, who is also a junior this year. He is also a member of cross-country indoor and outdoor track. 
He is a co-vice president for the Guilford High School class of 2024. He's a member of both the math and physics teams, a French Honor Society member, and a member of the Guilford uh, GHS Wind Ensemble, the Sports Band, and the Guilford Town Band. So welcome, George. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All. <coughs> Thank you. So this is um, uh, this is a time and agenda when we often hear from each of you about things that are going on in our schools. Um, uh, again, we may have board members who want to follow up and, and ask questions about some of what you report. Um, but I just want, as we kind of embark on this next year, um, to invite you to reach out to Ms. Chaff or, or to me or to Dr. Freeman if there are topics that you know, you're hearing about at school or things that you think you would like um, uh, to, to kind of uh, address with the board or, or things that, that would be important for the board to consider. I really welcome you to do that. I, I'm just going to be uh, honest about um, the fact that I think we've underutilized, if that's the appropriate word, or uh, under-engaged, that, that would be a better word, um, uh, and I took I take full responsibility that, for that, um, our student reps in the last couple of years. So I really want to make sure that this is um, not just a place that you report school events to, um, but we really like to engage with you on, on matters that you think are important for us to consider. So um, I just want to kind of welcome uh, welcome you with that statement and then turn it over now to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm representing A.W. Cox and Adams Middle School, as well as I was last year. Um, for A.W. Cox, they are kicking off the school year with their theme of courage, where the students got to dress up as superheroes last Friday. And it was very exciting to see all the um, little kids with their superhero costumes. And as for Adams Middle School, seventh graders are doing team bonding um, activities, which you know, opens doors for communication and connections within the ball, or sorry, in, within the Adams community, um, as well as activities and um, clubs after school. A lot of students are partaking in those, um, as well as sports teams. Um, it's just a very good beginning of the school year for both schools in the district. Uh, yeah, this year I'm going to be reporting on Calvin Lee and Baldwin Middle School. Um, this year, Calvin Leeds welcoming a new principal, Mike Seal. Uh, they're very excited to have him, and they're looking forward to a great year ahead. Um, on September 29th, Leed hosted a family beach party at the Jacobs Beach Pavilion. Uh, they had a pizza truck, ice cream, the whole thing. Uh, it was a great way to kick off the school year and enjoy Guilford's beautiful amenities. Um, students there rec recently began this year's enrichment programs. Those include cooking, running, and beekeeping. Uh, they give kids a chance to discover their passions and have a great time outside of the classroom. Uh, students at LEAD are also going to celebrate Diwali, the Festival of Lights, next Monday and Tuesday. Um, they're going to cover the blacktop in uh, ancient Indian Rangoli art, which will give kids a great chance to explore other cultures. Uh, for Baldwin, um, they're having a great start to this year. Um, They've begun the school year for the first time in quite a while with very few restrictions, which is awesome. Uh, BMS is the first time students from like all of Guilford's elementary schools are coming together, so relationship building is paramount there. Um, they're very pleased that last Thursday and Friday, all of their fifth grade students were able to participate in a team building trip to Camp Hazen. Um, all the hallways spent a full day at Camp Hazen in Chester, and they participated in a variety of team building activities there. Uh, BMS hosted two back to school nights. The grade five back to school night was on Monday, September 19th, and the grade six one was on Tuesday, September 20th. Parents had the chance to follow their kids' schedule, meet the teachers, and learn about their, their kids' daily experience at Baldwin. Um, both evenings were very well attended. Um, the BMS PTO has also been very supportive. This year they were able to provide funding to help support the Camp Hazen trips. They organized the BMS Guilford Citizens Day Parade Float, and they'll be hosting a trunk or treat activity later in uh, later on October. Um, to wrap it up, they are having a lot of after school clubs this year, um, including but not limited to drama club, art club, makers clubs, and hiking club. Uh, it's a great start to the year in both schools. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm doing <laughs> Guilford Lakes and Melissa Jones um, at Guilford Lakes for the first time since COVID. Um, the buddy system is back, so students are able to like, connect with. Um, other kids within the school, which is fun. 
Um, and then the Historical si Society this past week came and visited all the third graders, um, talking about different branches of government. Um, and then the third graders all got to do like a mock campaign and mock um, election. Um, the playground is still being built, built and worked on. <laughs> worked on. Um, hopefully, the lake students will be able to use it um, at the start of November. Um, and then the Fall Family Fun Festival is coming up, which I went to and was super fun. Um, so that's exciting. There's going to be a lot of activities um, f and food and stuff. So that's going to be super exciting. Um, at Melissa Jones, the students um, have also had a good start to the school year. Um, they're all following school expectations, being kind, safe, and responsible. Um, the field trips are back, um, so the students in grade one went to the Guilford Fair, and then all second graders um, were going to Bushy Hill. Um, the student is holding, uh, the school held a welcoming ceremony and reading celebration on Friday. Um, so all the kindergarten students, students and new students and staff were welcomed with crowns made by third graders. Um, and the ceremony was followed by an outdoor reading party to celebrate the fact that um, together the Melissa Jones kids read 3,513 books over the summer. Wow. <laughs> and then at the high school, um, at the high school we have the sports teams are all starting. Um, or I guess they've been going for a little while now. Um, and the music groups, they have a couple concerts coming up. Um, I believe the fall play has started, um, is started to be worked on. Yeah. As well as um, Ms. Chaff and Mr. Rabin held a um, kind of an open communications thing for Mastery Based Diploma. Um, the video is, all, is posted on the website um, for anybody who wants to go see it. I'm again in mastery this year, and it's interesting because you know we're now presented with the portrait of a gap graduate, which is a very interesting thing because I'm also an IB Spanish, so we see that you know the um, how you say in Spanish is perfil del estudiante, so it's like profile student profile. Um, so it's very similar, and I actually like enjoy seeing how Guilford Public Schools is you know adapting this new profile. Um, as well as I, be I believe the juniors are getting many more opportunities, which are gr which is great because we're the guinea pig class, I guess, <laughs> for everything. Um, but I heard that the junior class is going to be getting um, more opportunities for like if they have interviews, it'll be like mock trials for those interviews in the future, um, which is great for you know uh, jobs in the future. Excellent. Wonderful. Any. For our Great students. first report. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nerve-wracking, so you guys did a great job. It's fun to talk to adults. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> on, on camera. <laughs> Thank you very much. Your parents are watching, by the way. <laughs> um, um, you are welcome to say uh, what we have on the agenda tonight. Um, we're going to get an update on the assistant superintendent report, enrollment report, etc. Um, you are also more than welcome to go. We understand you have other commitments, certainly based on the wonderful introduction from uh, Dr. Schaff. You may have, se uh, Mrs. Schaff, you may have several commitments as, as well as homework. So I'll, I'll obviously also please feel free to, to exit if, if you would like. But we look forward to the year ahead with you um, and, and welcome you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. All right, um, Dr. Freeman, turning it over to you um, again for the update on assistant superintendent search. Thank you very much. So while we have been fortunate to have Mr. Goler filling this office in an interim capacity, we have also been busy um, moving forward with the search for a new permanent assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, we did launch a thought exchange question to the community to help guide us in this decision. Um, the question that we launched was, what characteristics, skills, knowledge, and past experiences should a highly effective assistant superintendent for curriculum, instruction, and assessment possess? The last time we had um, this opening, um, I conducted um, in-person focus group meetings with easel sheets, um, and I had three parents who came out to participate in that event to, to talk about what we were looking for in our next superintend assistant superintendent. Utilizing thought exchange, we had 327 unique participants who engaged in the conversation. They suggested 191 individual ideas or thoughts connected to that prompt, 
and that brought in 5,548 rankings of those 191 thoughts from the 327 participants. So we do feel that the thought exchange process it's, it's not in person, but it does give an opportunity for more participation in the process. Um, we had 220 parents of GPS students who participated in the survey. We had 93 staff members who participated in that invitation. And we had one student who participated in that in invitation. We're not sure from what grade level. Um, the top 10 thoughts that were suggested and then ranked by community members um, Number one was that a highly effective assistant superintendent in GPS will value teaching and learning with an emphasis on supporting teachers and principals. We heard that the new assistant superintendent will, em will emphasize teaching and learning, not test scores and assessments. Will be a good listener. Will be empathetic, transparent, and truthful with no political agenda will be open-minded to new ideas and new curriculum while being able to rely on past experiences to implement any changes. Those were your top five. Uh, will be a lifelong learner themselves. Uh, will have teaching experience. Uh, will have a willingness to learn and take perspectives from all when developing or thinking about curriculum. This includes educators, parents, and students. Uh, will have experience in classrooms of differing ages. Um, and the candidate, again, should have classroom teaching experience. Um, we have been meeting with candidates. Um, I'll take you through the timeline a little bit, but I want you to know that we used the thought exchange responses as we debriefed at the end of, I think it was just last week's formal round of interviews. To, to take a step back a little bit, um, we posted and advertised nationally for this position. We advertised in Ed Week and with AASA, uh, which both extend uh, nationally. We, ad we advertised locally in the New Haven Register, the Hartford Current, with the Connecticut's Public School Superintendents Association, uh, and with CT Reap, which posts all certified Connecticut teaching positions. Uh, we drew 32 completed applicants. And we drew primarily from the Northeast. Uh, with our principal searches earlier in the summer, we drew as far south as Florida and as far west as um, California. It was interesting that the response was more regional for this particular opening. So while we were very, very pleased with the quality of the pool, the quality was regionally sort of limited to the Northeast this time. Um, from those 32 completed applications, Mr. Bowden and I conducted 22 screening interviews. Of those 22, we moved six forward to a representative committee of 10 individuals. That committee included um, myself, building level administrators, a board of education representative, and Dr. Balistracy. Uh, teachers, teachers were in fact the largest. Uh, they represented three of the 10 people on the committee. We had two parents and we had one 12th grader. We had one uh, Guilford High School student who sat on that committee. We met, as I said, six of those candidates. Uh, and of those six, the, the committee is moving three candidates forward. This week, I will be meeting with each of those candidates individually. The assistant superintendent positions, there are only two in the district. They work very closely with me individually, so I'm having an individual meeting with each of those candidates to actually talk about uh, working styles and, and how they and I could partner in this position. Um, but then next week, on October 18th, those three individuals will be coming back to another committee, this one made of six individuals, uh, teachers, building administrators, and board members, and this is a more performance-based assessment. And so in this meeting, uh, we will be having the candidates um, look at some published educational um, opinion. We will have them viewing instruction and talking to us about what they actually see in classrooms. Uh, it's videotaped instruction, but it comes from real Guilford classrooms. And we will have them looking at uh, data and responding to the, those data with all of us at the meeting. At the same time, as I move through the individual meetings and prepare for the next committee level, uh, we're beginning more in-depth reference checking. And depending on the finalists of these three, there may very well be uh, site visits that are included as well. Um, we continue to remain essentially on track. We put together a very aggressive calendar for this search. 
but we do hope that we will have a candidate in front of this board, if not for your first meeting uh, in November, then possibly for your workshop meeting in November. So I really appreciate all of the participation in Thought Exchange, as well as the various people who have been participating in the committees. Really excited about the candidates that we continue to move forward. Uh, and again, uh, hope to have a candidate in front of this board sometime in November for your approval. Wonderful, and I know, um, obviously, as Dr. Freeman, as you just reported, parents had an opportunity, um, and I know we have parents among the board. Uh, you may or may not have taken part in this, um, but we've heard a, lo a lot of the comments. I, I did want to make sure um, board members had an opportunity, if they wished, to kind of share their thoughts on, on what you might hope we're looking for. Um, and, and, and if, again, it was echoed in, um, in what Dr. Freeman has already um, reported out from the parents, um, you may be well represented. But I did just want to make sure that if, if any of us had uh, something we wanted to share prior to this last step, um, this would be a good time to do it. Any? All right. Again, I just wanted to make sure. I know, I know there have been opportunities along the way, but I didn't want to, to leave that. I think the only thing is just to make, and this probably goes with the qualifications that these folks have already displayed, but a really good um, communicator with our community. You know, it's, it's a very academic role, but to just make sure that they are very comfortable in, in that arena of, you know, being a really solid and open communicator with our families. Great, valuable. Great. You know, we'll be looking for the next Ann Keen, Anine Crystal, and Jody Bowler. That's all. That's all <laughs> That's we're all. looking yeah. for. I know it's a tall order. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Freeman, if we are able to um, have someone in front of us for November, when would they start? That is going to be contingent on what their contract in their current employment um, says. So it could be. It could be 30 days if we're sort of fortunate. It could be as much as 90 days, depending mm -hmm. on what their current contract holds for them. Okay. Right. Excellent. Um, well, that sounds great. And um, uh, I, I've had the opportunity to sit on, um, as a board member, a number of search committees. I know a number of um, each of you have. It's, it's such a... Um, an interesting and great experience, but also really, um, I, I so appreciate the process, uh, Dr. Freeman, that you've set up in, in terms of not only the, the many steps <laughs> that someone has to go through, um, but the, the range of perspectives that get brought into um, the assessment process is, um, is so important. So It's I, so I, helpful I to have a student voice at the table. Oh, it, it's um, wonderful when we can students Really, really fabulous. Um, a, a very important perspective and, um, and great questions. Um, so I just naming that I really, it, it's a rigorous process, um, which I appreciate. Um, but the number of, the way that a number of people in the community and the school community are brought together, I think is, is very valuable. Thank you. I also wanted to give the annual update. October 1st is our official um, enrollment day, and so I want to report out to you what our official, our official school enrollment looks like. Now, this number will continue to change over the course of the school year, but for all state required reporting purposes, this will be our official enrollment for school year 22-23. There's a lot of information on this page. So what I'll draw your, it's why I particularly like this, this way of looking at enrollment. What we're looking at this school year is that in grades pre-K through four, we have a total enrollment of 1,113 students when you include the pre-K classes. If pre-K is not counted, if you're looking only at K through four, we're looking at an enrollment of 1,065 students. At Baldwin, in grades five and six, we have 468 students enrolled. I'm over on the bottom left. At Adams, in grades seven and eight, we have 486 students enrolled. And at Guilford High School this year, we have a total enrollment of 1,051 students. This gives us a total school enrollment this year, district enrollment rather, uh, pre-K through 12 of 3,124 students. When you look up at the large grid, this also allows you to see what the elementary sections look like. And what we can tell you is that in grades K through four, 
we run an average class size of 17.8. That is across 60 classrooms that are distributed uh, in four schools across five grades. We run high classes in the fourth grade that get as high as 22, and in one case actually hitting 23. And we run lows in the, element, uh, in the kindergarten sections uh, of a section as small as 14 or 13 students. Again, we've talked about this uh, many times. When we have neighborhood schools and when you distribute the classes across four locations, it makes it very difficult to get classes completely evenly distributed. If we had one school, pre-K through four of a thousand students, we would have classes that were completely evenly distributed, but there is some variation because of bubbles that may th move through any of those local communities. I do want to remind the board and point out for the community that this distribution includes the addition of two classes that were not budgeted for this year. I want to draw your attention to the kindergarten sections at Jones. We had budgeted for three kindergarten sections, but we added a fourth based on that enrollment. And I want to draw your attention to the second grade at LEET. We last year had two sections moving from grade one to two at this grade level, and we extended that to three sections again based on that enrollment. Now there has been other movement that has continued to occur, and again, these numbers aren't fixed. Um, I was contacted today by a parent who's relocating from one elementary district to another elementary district in Guilford. So uh, while we don't experience lots of movement or transients in Guilford across the school year, these numbers will continue to move and we will continue to track them. Also want to remind the board and note that in addition to the two unbudgeted classroom positions, we brought on an additional three unbudgeted special education positions over the summer, and that's in addition to an increase of one that was already built into the budget to add additional service uh, for special education across the district as well. So that's the October 1 snapshot, um, and again, we'll continue to monitor, but happy to answer any questions if there are any tonight. Can you explain at the pre-K level the, just the variance in the different class sizes? So uh, at the pre-K level, there are three all-day classes and two half-day classes. The smallest numbers that you see are students who are in for only half-day sections. Okay. Um, and then remember that pre-K is um, built around students with special educational yes. needs, and so it may have uh, as much to do with the complexity of the individual student needs as it does with the raw numbers. Those numbers will continue to change across the school year as well as we enroll uh, more students who, who pass the age of three and, and mm -hmm. need school servicing. of the trend of ninth through 12th grade as compared to one through fourth grade like averages 262 or so per class for the high school grades 213 for the elementary grades um, how does that line up with what else we're seeing statewide like I know we're kind of talking a lot about this downward trend in enrollment numbers like is this to be expected? Is this better than expected? Like, how are we kind of doing as a town? It is a slower decline than most other suburban communities have and are experiencing. So it is a decline. Uh, it appears to be slower than what other similarly situated communities are experiencing. Number of neighboring and surrounding communities have closed elementary schools because of the more severe declines that they were seeing. But that's also one of the significant questions we're asking in the new demographic study that we've just commissioned. So we will, a 10-year study, Linda? We have commissioned another 10-year demographic study looking forward. So hopefully that will give us more information on, on birth rates right, over the last five years that we don't really, as a school district, we only see kindergarten enrollment. And so hopefully we'll have more information from those five years and we'll be able to look at birth rates and we'll get an idea of what to expect moving forward. Um, the last 10-year demographic study that we had essentially sort of thought we'd see the same decline that other similarly situated communities experienced and so we've been declining but below the rate that was projected by that last study. Hoping this one shows something that we can sort of 
track a little more closely to. You will notice that there's a significant bubble class that is graduating from the high school this year. Senior class is significantly larger, you know, by 30 or 60 students than any of the classes that follow. And we've been watching, we talked about, we've been watching this in March, right, of the grades for, for a year. March, that's the way I think of it, I guess. Yes. But just the, 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 um, the, the lower class numbers um, as they as they it's, moved the, it's up. the millennial generation aging out of school, yeah. out of high school and, and grammar school. And the next generation is just much smaller. It's happening nationwide and actually in Europe as well. So, yeah. There's a few exceptions in Connecticut. South Windsor is actually bursting. They're growing. There's a couple other communities that are growing, but most suburban communities that you would consider similar to Guilford are shrinking. Mm -hmm. And that's a very unique situation there too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of love. Yeah. yeah. There's they're building schools to keep up with the population there. It's very yeah, in it's, Windsor. In South Windsor. In South Windsor. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a particular demographic that's moving and they like to live together. So it's yep. very interesting. It's an it's affinity community. Yep. Yeah. It's an affinity community that's yeah. growing. Okay. It's really fascinating. Um, terrific. Well, it, it uh, certainly these numbers suggest that the decisions for these classroom teachers were were good ones. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and uh, great to see. And, and the only thing I'll add is again that 17.8, right? So 18 is a really, a really generous class size. It is a good <coughs> class size to be able to have in our community, and we absolutely appreciate the community support to be able to provide class sizes in that range. It is, I would suggest, lower than many other communities in the state of Connecticut. Um, uh, my uh, my first board meeting in this town, not as a member, but uh, attending, um, was when my youngest of two was in a kindergarten class at this time now. He's 22, so this was a while ago, um, of 24. Yeah. And, and several parents, I was included, came to the board and said, you know, we'd like you to look at that. And, um, and, and the commitment to kind of lower class sizes since that time has been steady and consistent and um, Great. And that concludes my relatively brief report tonight. Wonderful. All right. Um, then we'll go on to the board agenda items. Um, 9.1 is to act on personnel items. So we are being asked to uh, ratify the appointment of the following teachers. Jenna Mealy for Cox Elementary School, a grade one teacher and Maria Kleiner, Cox Elementary School, a library media specialist. Is there a motion to approve these uh, appointment of these two teachers? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. All right. And then we're being asked to ratify the resignation of the following teacher, Elizabeth Evans, a point four FTE world language French teacher at Guilford High School. Is there a motion to ratify the resignation of Elizabeth Evans? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Terrific. That's everybody. All right. Uh, 9.2. Um, we're being asked to approve a donation of $3,520 from the Guilford High School Fencing Booster Club for a new metal strip for the fencing team. Um, happen to know the metal strips are what they fence on otherwise I imagine it sounds a little strange um, but is there a motion to approve uh, this donation from uh, the GHS fencing booster club so moved second second thanks all in favor Aye. 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 Um, and once again uh, thank you to the fencing booster club and and really thank you to all the booster clubs who uh, do a tremendous amount um, to support our, our athletic and, and other teams at, at the school. Absolutely. All right. Um, 9.3, act on setting a 2023 graduation date. I'm going to turn this over to you for a second, Dr. Freeman. Thank you very much. So I know the board is aware that with a change in legislation, there is no longer a requirement that we wait until April 1st before being able to set a graduation date. Uh, setting the date in advance uh, will allow families to plan their activities around graduation uh, and will allow the community, um, particularly uh, the group that plans for the all-night safe graduation event for our students, to plan and make reservations and hold a space for that event and gives them a lot of flexibility. I know that last year there were questions about 
if we identify the graduation date now and then there are snow days what happens with those in that situation so Ms. Chaff and I have spoken to a number of other districts and high schools around the state a number of districts who took advantage of this last year said very simply that the exam the graduation date is set the exam period is scheduled for the week prior to graduation should there be snow days that schedule will hold for the senior class and the last day of classes and the uh, exam schedule will slide forward for one or two or three days as necessary to accommodate the freshmen, the sophomores, and the juniors. The seniors will still have their graduation date. They will have their exams done. They will be welcome and in fact encouraged to attend school on any of those additional days, but it will have no impact on their ability to be prepared for graduation or the, their, the receipt of their diploma. So what it could mean is that we could have two last days of school, one for the senior class that you were being asked to approve tonight, and then one for the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. And again, that's what many of the high schools in the state have uh, did last year with the new legislation. And I think what many of us remember from when we went to school, I remember the senior class being done a little before the, the, the underclassmen graduated. Uh, Mrs. Chaff is here to answer any other questions if you had any more specific questions. Um, but again, we'd ask to set this date and allow uh, the senior community to start planning, the senior class community to start planning. Does anybody have any questions about this? Mm -hmm. Just uh, the exams. Like, so say a senior is taking a class that's typically a junior level, you know, a junior year class or something, and they've got a, a final that's now a day after grad. So they're coming back for that final. Is that? Or are you no, going to accommodate no, seniors would, somehow? With we would make an accommodation for that. Okay, got yeah. it. So there's some specific situation that kid will take it separately? Or yeah, so separately. we would allow that student to take the Good. exam or a version of that exam during the senior exam week, even if the rest of that predominantly junior class didn't take it until, until a week later. Right. Was that correct? Was that accurate? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just hate the idea of them graduating and then having to show up Monday to take like a final or something. Well, not and, I, and I imagine there there potentially could be a few teachers who are teaching a class of juniors and seniors together who are having to be a little bit flexible towards yeah. the end if, if this does occur. Correct. And just a reminder from our conversation last year, a lot of this, I would say a good number probably majority of the seniors are exempt from exams because they make sure that their grades are high enough that they do not have to take an exam. Um, that said, uh, the teachers are flexible with those combined classes that have different grades in them anyway. Right. And so I know that they can accommodate an early exam schedule for the seniors. Obviously, the administrative team will help to support that as well and make sure that the seniors get what they need before graduation day. Terrific. Does this affect the staff in any way? No. Yeah. No. The staff will continue to work through the last scheduled day of school as created by snow by snow events okay. Okay. or other emergency closings. Any other questions? We did have an opportunity, right, for a lot of this discussion at the end of last year yeah. as we were trying to grapple with this. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So, um, is there a motion to approve setting a 2023 graduation date for June 16th, 2023? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. All set. <coughs> um, 9.4 is to act on submission of consolidated grants applications. And I am going to ask for a little bit of support from Mrs. Trudeau um, to explain a little bit about what this is, if you would. Certainly. I didn't know if maybe Dr. Weller wanted to chime in on some of this as well. Oh, uh, uh, anyone who would like to help, <laughs> we are His welcome. office wrote the grant. grant oh, terrific. Grant oh, I'm so sorry. So, um, I that would be great. Have done it if he wasn't. I here, just since Mr. I know that I will not be the here. best person to explain it. <laughs> sure. Um, but, well, the consolidated grant includes Title One, Title Title um, Two, Three, and Four, and the Title One grant we, we submitted and we, we we got it approved, and and a lot of the grant that uh, that I worked with with Kathy on was actually informed by Anine before she left. Okay. So she looked at the the current use of the Title I grant for the 21-22 school year, and then she, to, to continue the work 
the district has done in this area, in, in these areas. She, she um, added um, money that was given, it's federal money, right. given, um, coordinated to support these activities. So this is, this is the, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, so ESSA grant um, funds. They must be used to narrow the achievement gap and create academic excellence for all students, prepare students for success in college and careers, support district and school improvement efforts, and support effective teaching and leadership. Um, I will note that across the Title I, II, III, and IV parts, um, we uh, get, and, and including then the, the LEARN Consortium, um, it's an application for $166,647. We are, of course, always um, grateful um, for the support. Um, a, a number of districts, obviously in Connecticut, um, <coughs> would receive um, considerably more Correct. Um, yeah. we are we're a community that is um, that is receiving 166 plus yeah these are federal grants they are based on community need primarily calculated based on our free and reduced lunch right. approved population um, and so this is the calculation these are the monies that we receive and the breakdown that you see in front of you shows you the areas in which we will target those dollars and you can see that they are in alignment with the four bullets at the top Right, so um, I'll just note for the public, Title I, Part A, the allocation um, of 108484 literacy and mathematics support for students performing below grade level, additional summer programming, uh, resources for embedded uh, and ongoing professional development, Title II, 41862 for professional learning academy program offered to teachers, um, STEM, uh, STEAM, STEAM, math, and co uh, math coaching and literacy coaching support, um, Title III, 6301 additional tutoring services to students who are English learners, um, and the Title IV allocation of 10,000 training for teachers in classroom discourse um, around dealing with controversial issues. Um, and diverse perspectives. Um, so um, again, supporting those four bullets above um, and, and allowing us to do a number of important things in the district. Just a point of clarification, STEAM is actually is, is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math with art thrown in there. Right, thank you. No, that's a, it's an important, that's an important There's distinction. There's STREAM too. There's STREAM? STREAM Robotics. Oh. Robotics. Oh. Very good. I have a question about the allocation of funds. You mentioned it has to do with uh, the application for free and reduced meals. Is that the general baseline for how the funds are allocated? The federal funds are, are allocated based on need. And then as you note in the four bullets above, they need to target helping students who, who represent that right. need in, in closing their achievement gaps. So yes, so there are some um, they're dollars that are there for us as long as we spend them in the I identified areas. And Guilford receives a relatively low amount of dollars yeah. compared to some other communities because of that relative measure of need. I, I, the only reason why I bring it up is because, you know, in the last two, two years or so, right, we've, we've had, you know, free, free lunches. And so I just wonder how that plays into allocation when you don't have the typical amount of um, applications for free and reduced lunches that you nor in a normal year you would. Right. So is it a true measure of what each town truly needs? It's a more complicated measure than that, but free and reduced lunch is a significant portion of the formula that they use to determine that local need. And so yeah, it is, right, it's important for families who, who qualify for those free and reduced lunch um, benefits to, to fill out the application so their children can take advantage of those benefits, but it also then benefits us yeah. when calculating that need and, and generating dollars that will then come to the school system. Yep. Well, and again, that's a great point, and there, every district in Connecticut is having that same issue, I can right. tell you right. from personal experience. So I think the state looking at that and, and receiving federal dollars, that usually is a slight increase from one year to the next. Um, Guilf Guilford looks like it received similar funding to, to last year. Very good. Other questions? All right. Um, so we're being asked again um, to act on this. Is there a motion to approve um, the submission of consolidated grants application? So moved. Second. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody. Excellent.
All right. Um, 9.5 is just a receive item. Um, this is our budget timeline. Somehow already, already another <laughs> another year of considering um, considering budgets. Um, so it does give us a timeline um, through um, early spring. I did want to bring to the community's attention that next Wednesday, October 19th at 7.30 um, here in um, Guilford High School Media Center, we will hold our um, public input on the 2022-2023 budget. This is an opportunity for the community to come um, to the Board of Ed and um, note things that you would like us and the administration to consider as the budgets are being formed. So there's not a budget to comment on yet, um, but it's really an opportunity for um, the public to note uh, things that they would like us to consider um, or prioritize. So again, that is next Wednesday, October 19th, um, here at Guilford High School at 7.30. Do I have that right time right as well? I just yes. want to make sure. Yes. Excellent. All right. And would we just one of those meetings? This we year? do one of those. Well, um, so we we, we typically do. January. No, we typically do one in the okay. in the um, in the fall, and then so in January, at the end of January, we, we will do two. When there's an actual budget. When to there's an actual on. With, right. uh, budget, yeah. um, and then of course we are all seeing mm -hmm. on this timeline a number of um, other meetings uh, dispersed throughout this that we'll want to be paying attention to. Um, we have a couple of joint meetings with the Board of Finance, um, meeting with the district leadership team. Um, these all come up uh, in December and January. Uh, meanwhile, our administration is attending all kinds of meetings uh, related to the budget. Um, so that's a receive item. Any questions about that? All right. Um, we did have um, on the agenda 9.6 recommendations from the policy committee. We are going to be holding these um, until um, the next meeting. So um, we're just going to defer that item um, for this evening. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and so I'm um, up to uh, 10 reports of committees. I imagine the policy committee may have something in addition to those um, or not. Well, um, we are tabling most of those just simply because we couldn't get the documents to this board in time for tonight. Um, what we discussed in our policy meeting, first of all, thank you everybody. I, I had asked the whole board to attend that meeting and I'm really grateful that so many people were able to make that. Thank you. Um, we discussed um, a few new policies um, some changes to some old policies of which the public will hear in our next meeting when we're actually going over the policies themselves. Um, in summary, we discussed student wellness, nutrition, and physical activity, which is a focus really on healthy food options and making sure that we've got food and beverages um, that are healthy available for all of our students. Um, we talked about Title IX, which is about sexual harassment and discrimination, which is really um, Connecticut state statutes that we've got to uphold. Um, uh, we talked about community participation at board meetings to try to streamline that and make it logical for folks to be able to come and talk to us. And we spent some time discussing bylaws, which are simply kind of the rules by which this committee operates. Um, so we'll have more specific detail on that once we're actually able to take a look at all of those and vote on them in our next meeting. Perfect. Thank you. Um, operations Committee. We have no real update other than what we've already covered in the meeting. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, curriculum Instruction and Assessment Committee. We're meeting on the 19th. Wonderful. So that's coming up. All right. Um, liaisons to Town Committee. 24th. The 24th, oh, yes. The Oops, 19th the 24th. is a special meeting. We meet before the regular meeting on the 24th. Oh, 24th. Yes. Okay. Thank you. October 24th. Um, does anybody have liaisons to town committees? Anything to report out? <laughs> All right. Um, liaison to learn board of directors. We are discussing an approach um, uh, to uh, attend that meeting, which happens on the second Thursday uh, of the month in the morning. 
hard with a number of us who, who are working, but we will uh, continue to talk about that. Um, so we've gotten through uh, reports of committees. Um, number 11, an opportunity for the public, if anybody has a uh, public comment that they would like to direct to the board, this is an opportunity to do that. Anybody? Um, I ask that you give your name and uh, address and ask that you limit comments to four minutes, please. I will keep time. I'll raise my hand at three minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Can you not have the camera on me, please? Yeah, you know, by rights, I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry? To, I'm not supposed to move the camera away from somebody that's in the meeting. Illegally, I don't think so, but I'll do it. Uh, no, it's not a legal concern. No, yeah. I think it's okay to keep it on the board. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you can keep it on the board. Thank you. It's supposed to be a document of what happened. So, yeah, well, understood. Okay. You can still hear me. <clears throat> um, I'm here to talk about the systematic racism of having more cops in our school again. And I am still very much still very angry and still have a lot to say. But, you know, um, I guess, you know, how can I put this? Um, I was reading the names of victims when I was interrupted and dismissed last time. And these are lives of black and brown people that have been murdered by police. And not only did I find that extremely disrespectful, I found that unnecessary because I have come to this Board of Ed over the years, many times before, I have watched plenty of people go over their time. I have had the chance to come up twice to the podium in one meeting before. There was nobody after me. A simple moment of silence to honor the victims of police brutality would have been enough. Um, so, you know, when an all white board tells a Latina that you're gonna call a recess, which is something I've never seen you do before. That's systematic racism. And I do not appreciate that. Um, but I will thank you for not having the police presence today. Um, and since my personal experiences of feelings, how I dealt with that is not something that needs to be addressed further. I'm just going to read a few passages from a um, document I found at the Yukon Center of Education Policy and Analysis about SROs. And so, here we go. And I'll be happy to email these to the board. SROs are more likely to work, um, are associated with higher rates of exclusionary discipline and arrest. Additionally, numerous studies show that the presence of SROs in school is associated with higher rates of exclusion, exclusionary discipline, suspension and expulsion, increased risk of students being pushed into the school to prison pipeline, Students of colors across the nation, and in Connecticut in particular, are disproportionately subject to these exclusionary discipline practices. In Connecticut, suspension and expulsion rates for black and Latino male students are two to three times that of their white counterparts. The suspension rates of black female students is around five times that of their white counterparts. The presence of SROs is associated with increased racial disparity in suspension rates. SROs are associated with increased school arrest and thus may accelerate the school to prison pipeline. For example, schools that employed police had an arrest rate of 3.5 times that of schools without police. 
as an exclusionary discipline, students of color are disproportionately subject to school arrests. In Connecticut, black and Latino students are arrested at four times and two times the rate of white students. So I'm going to ask you to, to please wrap up your comments. And then if you have stuff that you would like to email us um, to read, you may certainly do that. All of our email addresses are on the website. Moreover, trauma and anxiety symptoms can increase with the frequency of police contact, regardless of where that contact occurs. The presence of police shifts the focus from learning and supporting students to over-disciplining and criminalizing them. I'm going to ask you to wrap up your comments, please, because you've reached the four-minute limit. And then please feel free to, to reach out by email if you have more that you want to share with us. Okay. Um, I just want to say um, that this, this gets changed because there's no need to have more security. It has been proven time and again that it does not stop mass shootings. And if that's the only reason to do it, then it shouldn't be there. There okay. should not be police here. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Is there anyone else um, in the public who would like to address the board at this time? <coughs> I'm going to ask to give your name and address, sure. if you would. Thanks so much. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Hetherington. I live at 150 Boston Street in Guilford. Uh, just wanted to thank all of you for the, uh, um, what is, I'm well aware, a very thankless job. And um, you all volunteer, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, very late to this discussion, because I know in 2015, um, you moved the school start time for um, Guilford High School back uh, 15 minutes. And um, I'm sure that was the product of very hard one compromise and controversy and um, so uh, I, I don't mean to thrust more controversy upon you but um, I do think moving start times particularly for high schools uh, back is one of the um, one of the things that has the most clear research support for improving safety improving educational outcomes it, I, I know it's very complicated potentially costly um, but I would like to respectfully ask that it remain on the docket as something that we consider. It seems like um, a, lot of, a lot of positives if we can work through the complexity of it. Wonderful. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think we had, I want to say that committee met for three or four, three years? It was three or four years. Um, but it's such an important issue. Um, for sure. So uh, thank you for, for bringing it to our attention. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? All right. Um, I, that brings us to the end of our meeting tonight. Um, again, a reminder to the public about um, the public input on uh, the budget next Wednesday. Um, and I um, will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting tonight. So moved. Second. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you.